So in Matthew 16, again, we were talking about patterns and seeing patterns and, and understanding or learning from the pattern what the, what the Bible is trying to teach. Um, seeing these patterns are so significant, they're so important. Um, actually, again, this is what the prophecies and typology is based on, is the pattern. So here we're just going to look at a small pattern that you see in the Gospels. And then, but it tells us volumes about what's going on with Jesus and the disciples. So in Matthew 16, 21, it says, from that time forth, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders, of the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. So I mentioned already, I mentioned before, you know, Matthew's using kingdom language, right? So he describes the people that are going to take Jesus in terms of three parts, three parts of the kingdom. They're going to coalesce against Jesus. Of course, it's the only way that Jesus can be put to death is if the three parts of Satan's kingdom coalesce. And so you see here, he uses the three-part language, the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. Um, he also, Jesus describes three things that are going to happen to him. Again, kingdom language. He's going to suffer He's going to be killed and he's going to raise again the third day. So Jesus is telling his disciples, telling them ahead of time what's going to happen because he's trying to prepare them for the crisis. He knows that this is going to be a, a, a trial, a great crisis for his disciples. And uh, so he's trying to prepare them ahead of time. God always tries to prepare us for ahead of time what's coming, for what's coming. So, of course, Peter plays the role of the disciples in verse 22. Peter takes him to the side and rebukes him, saying, Be it far from me, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. So Peter plays the role of all the disciples. They just can't, this just doesn't register. This doesn't fit uh, their picture of reality. This is not what their expectations about Christ and, and his ministry. I mean, they've just come from the earlier chapter. You have a multitude following Jesus, and he's feeding the multitude with, with a few loaves, and he's healing all these people. And, and they, they just think, you know, look at all these masses of people that are behind you and supportive of you. And, and, you know, surely he's going to go to Jerusalem and become king. And all these multitudes are going to stand up and support him. And, and all, their, all their worldly expectations of success and grandeur and positions of authority and all this other stuff are going to take place. And Jesus is telling them, no, this is not what's going to happen. Remnant um, theology? Yeah. <laughs> right. So... After Matthew 16, you know, Jesus tells them there's some standing here that won't taste death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. That's the end of Matthew 16. And then, of course, Matthew 17, Jesus goes up on the mount with Peter, James, and John. And they're tra he's transfigured, and they see the kingdom of God. They see Moses and Elijah and Christ glorified. They see the, you know, the king with the two witnesses. They see, uh, they, they, they see the kingdom. Then, when the, of course, when they come back down the mountain... Then Matthew says again in verse 22, while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. They shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And again, it says to the disciples, they were exceedingly sorry. So in other words, they, they, just, they just got really sad. They just, they just didn't understand this. So in this context, Matthew 18, verse 1, says that the, at, the, at the same time came disciples, the disciples to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And of course, Jesus tries to teach them, bringing the little child, teaching them their misconceptions and misunderstanding of the kingdom. But the point that I'm making is, is that, first of all, you're going to see this pattern where Jesus tells them, predicts his death and his resurrection. Then He's going to be transfigured. That he's going to show them the kingdom. Then again, he predicts his death. Then, then there's this. Then there's this discussion amongst the disciples about who's the greatest. And the, this discussion about who is the greatest is the reason why they can't understand what Jesus is saying about predicting his suffering and his death. It's also why they don't understand what's going on on the Mount of Transfiguration, because their idea, their idea of being great and their idea of God's kingdom being established has a worldly, selfish, self-centered concept um, that is not part of God's kingdom. So Matthew gives us this, this pattern, okay? So now I want to take you to Mark. If you go to Mark chapter 8, 
And I'm skipping a bunch of stuff. We can go back and again, there's more to these patterns. But if you go to Mark chapter eight and look at verse 31. <clears throat> He tells them again. Yep. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. Now, again, notice Mark uses the same kingdom language, mm -hmm. right? To be killed and to raise again. So he, he uses the same, same kingdom language. And he spoke, he spoke that saying openly. And, of course, Peter then Peter does the same thing. So Mark records the same the same incident with Peter and Jesus telling them about his suffering, his death, his crucifixion. All right. Then, of course, in Matthew 9, that's where Matthew, Matthew. Ma Mark mm -hmm. connects the verse, Ma Ma Mark 9, verse 1. He connects the verse of when Jesus talked about the kingdom coming with power with the transfiguration in Mark 9. And so he does the same thing. There's a transfiguration. They go up on the mountain. They see Jesus transfigured. They see the kingdom in miniature. They also, by the way, have the experience on the top of the mountain that Jesus is actually describing. Remember, uh, when Jesus is transfigured and God speaks, remember the disciples fall on their face. They have this death resurrection experience on the top of the mountain. Um, so again, if they understood what Jesus was saying and they understood their experience on the top of the mountain, it wouldn't have been... a it wouldn't have been such a surprise to them that Jesus is talking about suffering and death and resurrection. Um, anyways, so when they come back down the mountain, and now in Mark, Mark uh, verse 30 and 32, 30 32, it says, They departed from thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, that the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, they shall kill him, and after he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But again, verse 32, they did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask. So here again, the same pattern. Jesus tells them about his death, his, his treatment of rejection by the Jews. He's transfigured. Then again, he tells them about his rejection and his death and resurrection. And then after this, verse 33, you'll notice very, the very next thing. Uh, he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, uh, he asked them, what was it that you di dis disputed or arguing amongst yourselves, by the way? And they held their peace, for, for by the way, they had disputed among themselves about who should be the greatest. So the reason, again, the reason that they can't understand what Jesus is saying is they're actually arguing amongst themselves about who's going to be first. They're actually arguing amongst themselves about who's the greatest. Now, let me put this in some context for you. When Jesus gathered his disciples, Jesus called his disciples. Judaism at this time is, is, is broken into all these different sects, all these different little groups with all their different little theologies. So there's, there's the synagogue of the freedmen, there's the Pharisees, there's the Sadducees, there's the Essenes, there's the Zealots, there's all these different groups. And everybody thinks that their perspective of, the, of, of God is correct, and their theology about the end is correct, and they're, you know, they're correct, and the other people are all wrong. So Judaism has fragmented into all these little, little different groups with all these little, little different positions. And, the, and they've all hardened themselves in their positions that they're right. And everybody else has to be wrong because they're right. But so, that's exactly the way Christianity is today. No. Adventism. Ad, that's right. Adventism is today. And the rest of Christianity is as well. But Adventism specifically. So you'll notice that Jesus, called, when he calls his disciples, he purposely calls them from all, from all these diff, different groups. And never once, never Ad once does he... Never once does he sit down and tell them, okay, you're, you're right. This, this is the group that's right. Or this, oh, you're right on this. No, you're right on that. He never says that. No, he never says that. Well, all he tells them is that you're deceived. You don't understand. That's what he keeps telling them. And part of their deception is that they think that they're so right. And they're so zealous to push their, 
that they, their theology or their agenda that they can't see themselves, they can't see Christ, they can't hear what he's saying. And Jesus is trying to break them out of all, out of these different sects to bring them to himself, to see him as what's most important. So when they're fighting about who is the greatest or who should be next to great, it isn't just, it isn't just I should be in front of you because I'm me. No, it, part, of, part of that is, is that I should be next to Jesus because I'm right about this, this, and this, and this, and you're wrong. And so, therefore, my theology is the correct theology. So it's it's the theology that's going to be presented when God sets up this kingdom. Certainly, he's going to present what I believe to be true as the truth, because what I believe is the truth. And what you guys all believe is wrong. So this is this is what's going on. It's not just a, a personal struggle about who's who should be next to Jesus. It's it's actually a theological, these are theological arguments going on. Yes. Yeah, and, and that that can even answer why verse. 32 it says but they understood not the saying and were afraid to ask him or are they afraid that their little fantasy that they were going through here was going to get dashed that's right that's oh. right and, and mrs white in zarvage she says that when they were walking along she said the disciples specifically separated themselves from jesus so jesus is walking ahead of them and then there's this gap because they're arguing, and they don't want to argue about who's greatest in the in the presence of Jesus. They're, 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 you know, the presence of Jesus just convicts them that something's wrong with this. So they they literally have to separate themselves from Jesus while they're walking along the way to have this discussion. And that's why Jesus says, "Well, what are you what are you arguing about along the way?" And of course, they don't want to talk about it because they're 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 it, it's obvious something's wrong, right? So, so this is what has blinded the mind of the disciples, that they're not understanding. They, they don't understand what's going on. They don't understand what's happening. They can't see it because they're so filled with their own ideas that they, there's no room for God to speak to them. Now, the last one is Luke. And, and, and Luke is really interesting, the book of Luke. Uh, and Luke 9, Luke 9 is very specifically and very important. Um, the other the way, go ahead Greg. jesus just just as easily could have said you know he was going to be beaten and and, and killed of the adventists and then rise the third day i mean it's, the parallels are yep mm -hmm. that's right right there yeah because the jews thought the romans were the problem right the jews yeah. thought that the romans were the ones that were going to persecute them so they had no, the disciples had no idea where this wave of hell is going to come from. Just like and Adventists Jesus, are looking to the Pope. That's right. So Jesus is trying to warn them that the very church you belong to, the very brothers that you think are the leaders of the, your, your church that are on your side, they're the very ones that are going to kill you. But, but, but see, we, they think the disciples thought it was, you know, the Romans, it was somebody else. Just no, like Adventists think the Sunday keepers, you know, it's the Pope. They're yeah. the problem. That's that's not what's going on. Now, and, now and again, the Romans ultimately did did kill Jesus, but it was at the prompting of the Jews. Oh yeah, yeah, but right, but see, they're not killing Jesus because he's the Messiah. They don't care. That's they, right. They have they have no beef. They you know they would have let him go. They there's they just Pilate was just the, the Romans were just trying to keep the the peace because the insurrection of the Jews had caused. The rebellion had caused strife in the Roman kingdom, but they don't have a beef against Jesus or the, or the disciples. They don't care. Jesus um, was uh, teaching them about his death, that they may see the death that needs to occur with themselves, but that's they were failing right. to see that. Death. That's right, James. That's exactly right. And that's why in the midst of this little structure, you got the Caiaphatic structure, when he pr predicts his death, talks about his death, then there's the transfiguration, then he predicts his death again. The, the reason that Caius' structure is there because he's telling them verbally about what their experience, is, what his experience is going to be. So they will realize that that needs to be their experience. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, that was the experience of Peter, James, and John, which they were to understand they need to die to self to enter the kingdom. And then again, he tells them again. And that's exactly the structure. That's exactly the reason why it happens this way and why all three gospels record it that way. Now, here in Luke 9, Luke 9 is very, very interesting. And I'm going to 
share some things with you about it. Because Luke writes his gospel a little bit different than Matthew and Mark. Ma you'll notice there was these time elements that we mentioned. Matthew will say from this time, Jesus began to do this, whatever. But notice in, in, in Luke 9, look at verse 51. See, something happens in Luke 9, which is amazing for the rest to understand the rest of the book. It says in verse 51, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So here in Luke 9, the, re the rest of the book, of the rest of the whole book of Luke from chapter 9 all the way to his crucifixion is focused on his, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is his last journey to Jerusalem. And so this takes up the majority of the book, the, the gospel of Luke. The, Luke puts most of his teachings in the context of his journey to go to Jerusalem. This, this is significant. Because this is when he calls the 70 and send, sends, sends them out by two. This is when he gives authority. Right before this, he gives authority to his, to his uh, apostles and sends them out. And they start healing and raising the dead and cleansing lepers. And This is all in the context of him setting his face to go to Jerusalem. And the whole point here is that he's beginning to proclaim himself the king. And this is going to end in the triumphal entry that you see before he goes to Jerusalem. And then he knows... That this setting his face to go to Jerusalem and his triumphal entry as king is actually is why they're going to kill him. It's going to culminate in his his death and his crucifixion. When he presents himself to the to to the Jewish nation as their king, that means that he that that's his death knell, and he knows it. it so it the also, majority. Sorry. Go ahead. It also shows how much he loved them. That he that's knew right. that that was going to happen, but he went anyway because he so long to reach them right and before this and, and especially in matthew and the other gospels and also in luke you'll notice that jesus purposely doesn't go to jerusalem he avoids jerusalem or he, he'll go and preach the gospel somewhere and then he won't go to that place anymore so he he purposely goes and doesn't go for the purpose of doing god's will of presenting the gospel so this he, he hasn't gone to jerusalem because when the first time he went out, well, actually was in John chapter 5 when he cleanses uh, the man at the pool of Bethesda. They want to kill him from there on. So Jesus avoids going to Jerusalem for a while. He won't go because he knows when he does go and presents himself as the king, it's going to be his end. So that's He has to do it at the right, at the ordained time. That's right. And that's why it says in verse 51, it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. So Jesus was aware of the time, the timing, right? So you know, it's, pretty, it's pretty interesting as well, as Jesus exits, exits the most holy place, that those things will come about as well. The healing, the whole, uh, you know. That's right. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and I'm seeing this in, in, as you're speaking, and as he is coming into Jerusalem as king, and I am seeing him coming to earth as king. That's right. To receive his That's people right. to see that. And the benefits, the, the reason that there's healing and power attending his message is because the blessings and the benefits of God's presence and the blessings and benefits of the most holy place are now being poured out to the people as he comes out. See, um, Remember the woman that was sick with, with the issue of blood? She touched the hem of his robe. See, this, this is cultural. When the high priest came out of the most holy place, the people would touch the hem of his robe because he'd been in the presence of God. And so to touch the hem of his garment is to receive the blessings that have, that have come down from heaven to earth. Remember the, at, the, at, the, uh, at the hem of his robe and the bottom of the high priest's garment, there's a pomegranate and a bell and a pomegranate and a bell. See, those are blessings. And those blessings come down from heaven. That's where they're. At the, so when she, when she by faith grabs hold of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the garment of Christ, the hem of his garment, she's, she's acknowledging that he's come down from heaven and she's seeking the blessing that comes from, from heaven. And she receives the blessing, the healing. This is why, again, the latter rain, we, we talk about healings and, and, you know, 
power attending the message because the, the blessings from the very presence of God are going to come, come down to his people. And they come down to his people through Christ. His, that's from his kingship. And, and so you're exactly, you're exactly correct. Malachi 4.2 tells us that the hem of his garment represents his righteousness. That's right. That's and the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his beams. Yes. That's right. In Malachi. That's right. So here again, you know what I'm going to show you in Luke 9, verse 21. Um, he says, he, he tells, verse 9, to, it's actually verse 22, the son of man must suffer many things, be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be slain and be raised the third day. So here Luke is recording the same instance where Jesus is telling them that he's going to go to Jerusalem and he's going to be mistreated and he's going to die. And he said he's going to be mistreated. He keeps telling them he's going to be mistreated by his own people. Mm -hmm. He's not, it's not the Romans. And again, the same scenario happens in Luke, later in Luke 9, verses 43 to 45. Uh, I'm sorry, verse, verse 28. We see Jesus um, taking Peter, James, and John goes up the mountain and he's transfigured. And they see the kingdom of God. They see, they see Moses and Elijah. And Moses and Elijah are talking to Jesus about his, his exodus, his Passover, his, some will, some will say his ascension. Really, they're talking to him about his death and his resurrection. They, they know what's coming because Moses and Elijah face the same thing. So after, after the transfiguration in verse 43, uh, Luke 9, Verse 43 says, they were all amazed at the mighty power of God, but while they wondered, everyone at all these things which Jesus did, he said to his, he said to his disciples, and listen to Luke. Luke says, let these sayings sink down into your ears. For the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But they did, they, they understood not this saying. It was hid from them, and they did not perceive it, and they feared to ask him anything. So, so Luke is very emphatic. Jesus is saying, he says, Jesus is saying, let what I'm saying sink down into your ears, but they still can't hear him. Isn't that amazing? So Jesus is repeatedly telling them plainly what's to take place, and they can't hear what he's saying because it dashes their whole perspective of reality, which will just fall apart. Yes, Cynthia. So it says these things were hidden from them. Did God right. allow that that naivete or ignorance or whatever? Did He allow that to happen? No, 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 the, no. The they reason just that it, were, they just were not getting it. Well, look at the next verse. Where are you now? And Luke four. I'm Luke nine, verse forty-five, and then that's what we just read. And I'll read verse forty-six. And a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be greatest. So what is, is, G, is God blocking their thinking so they can't understand? Or is, are, they, are they messing up their own minds so they can't hear? Yeah, they had moved on from what he was saying. Yeah, so the point here is, again, see, God isn't doing these things to us. God is trying to help us undo the things we're doing to ourselves. Amen. So... God is not the one doing it. God is trying to desperately trying to save us from ourselves. And we, we are so hell bent on, on our perspective of reality being the way it is that we refuse to let go of that, which we think to be true, even though it's a lie, no matter how plainly God speaks to us, we can't, we can't hear what he says. It's hidden from us, but what's, but what's hidden, God isn't hiding it. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden? Is God the one that put fig leaves on them to make a veil so they couldn't see him? Did God do that? No. No. No, no the veils, they put the veils on. And, and by the way, do the veils hide their nakedness from God? No. no. But don't you think it's pretty scary for us that these men were with him at that time? He, time after time, he told them and they still didn't get it. And we're, looking and we're doing the same times. thing. Right, we're looking at end times and, you know, we think we're catching on, but 
man, if we think we're catching on and they were with Jesus, we're really stuck. Well, the, 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 but see, that's right, Cynthia. So the point here is, is that what, what, they were, what they refused to accept was the very thing that James mentioned. That somehow, see, somehow, this is what I was sharing last night about this remnant theology versus kingdom theology, is that somehow we have it all planned out that last day events is somehow about us. And these, sun, these mean Sunday keepers are going to chase us around in the woods. But so we need to learn how to dig up roots and stuff to live through the time of trouble. But before things get too uncomfortable and your comfort level drops, don't worry. Jesus will come and save you out of that. Where did that theology come from? I don't know. Is that in the Bible? No, no. he doesn't tell us that. So somehow, somehow we've made ourselves the center of last day events as if you know the world is coming after us and the, and, the, and, the, and the problem is the evil Sunday keepers and we're okay we're just waiting for Jesus to come but see that's that's the deception that's we're not the, okay that's the same deception that the disciples had they're okay they're just waiting for the kingdom to be established so God, so Jesus can assign them positions of authority and Jesus is Jesus is saying no no you don't understand but none of them were truly converted until after his death, were they? No. Well, I would say, I would say the conversion was in process. But we know that uh, Jesus specifically says to Peter that when you are converted, strengthen your brothers. So we know that Peter isn't really converted yet. I mean, he's a follower of Jesus. And he'll pick up a sword and fight anybody about it, but that's not, he's not converted. <laughs> it isn't until, until the cock crows that, that Peter's converted. Yeah. That's when he gets it. Right. Is that brought into an their, first, their first that's, step was being baptized. And then their, their walk was their walk with Christ. And their walk with him, even just like us, he's with, he's with us in the wilderness. And sometimes we don't see him in the wilderness. That's and, right. Yeah. And that was their wilderness, their walk with that Jesus was. was their wilderness experience. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Brother Greg, go ahead. I would say the, the main place where the misconception is coming from is from a, a misinterpretation of certain statements in the spirit of prophecy. People latch on to a handful of statements and take them out of context, and they don't really under this, understand the scriptures that they're based on. And they say, oh, see, she says we flee into the wilderness and, and then God will deliver us. And that's, you know, that's, that's where it's coming from. Yes, but what she's quoting is actually actual scripture. Remember in Matthew 24, Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation, then flee to the mountains, right? Yeah. Yes, but see, he, he's actually talking about a, the process of the abomination of desolation and the idea of fleeing to the mountains. Of course, that's where he is in Matthew 24. He's on the Mount of, he's on the Mount of Olives, which is the Mount of Destruction. And he, and he went to the Mount of Olives. Why did he go there? Well, because the abomination of desolation just happened. They rejected him as their Messiah. But he's not telling them that the end is going to happen with them running around in the woods and Jesus is going to come and save them before trouble comes. That's not what he's saying. Because the abomination of desolation is going to continue his death. They're going to crucify him. So their rejection of him and the temple was the beginning of the abomination of desolation. His crucifixion is the, is the, is, is the actual abomination of desolation. And, and Jesus, what Jesus is telling them and has told them multiple times is if you want to be in my kingdom, then you have to follow me. And they didn't get that. So then he says, if you want to be, if any of you want to be my disciples, you must take up your cross and follow me. Mm -hmm. yes. So he's not telling them you just follow him. He's telling them that you have to, you have to go through the same death resurrection experience that I'm going to go through to be part of my kingdom. Go ahead. I was just wondering if another take on this idea is that um, it's to be anti-Christ to um, consider one exalting oneself and that he said there would be many antichrists coming. And was he also speaking the, day, the disciples situation as it is my situation, I would be antichrist if the focus is not on him. That's right. That's right. Because I'm making the focus something other than Christ. So I'm putting something instead of Christ. 
and that's antichrist. That's right. And I'm exalting my ideas above the word of God, the truth of God. That's that's antichrist. That's me, humanism, you know, saving myself or whatever. That's right. So what we see in the micro of myself, you can also see in the macro of, you know, the beast in his image and all the prophetic things that we talked about. Sue, did you have a comment? Um, I, I, I always tend to, to um, key on certain words and patterns is one of them. So, I, you know, as you're talking about patterns, I'm, I, I decided, well, I'm going to look up. They know patterns. They knew it from the beginning when they talked about the pattern of the tabernacles and then they continue. They knew what the patterns meant all the way through and then oops then in then they it's ex exemplified in in hebrews 8 who serve unto the example of the shadow of heavenly things as moses was admonished of god when he was about to make the tabernacle for see he said that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount so they understood um the mount, the pattern, and they weren't seeing it. They, they weren't seeing that other things that were coming around were the patterns. Right. And, Mr. Tim? And, yes. It's hit me very ironically funny. So we're running around looking out for the Antichrist, but if we're focused on, we think Adventism is where the focus is, then we are Antichrist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and if when God shows us the truth, we hold on to our ideas, then we are crucifying Christ rather than ourselves. I mean, these are our choices, right? We self is crucified and, and so Christ can live or Christ is crucified so self can live. Those, though, that's your choice, right? So when God shows you, when God shows us, and by the way, the time of trouble, the time of trouble that we have is not, is not because of other, other people hurting us. Or taking our stuff that's not our time of trouble no my time of trouble is when god shows me me and i see me and i and i have to let self die so christ will live and i i have to i have to surrender my ideas and myself and and put myself in his, that that's my time of trouble that's when self dies and 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 i mean that's what that's what happened to jacob when jacob was wrestling with the angel for his time of trouble the, the problem wasn't the problem wasn't Esau. The problem wasn't Laban. The problem wasn't the army of people coming. No, the problem with Jacob was Jacob. And what God shows Jacob is he shows him he shows him himself. And Satan is right there trying to show Jacob himself too to discourage him. That's the, the time of Jacob's trouble. And by the way, Mrs. White nails this. She nails it. The time of Jacob's trouble, the time of trouble for, for us before Jesus comes is not because somebody else is chasing us around. That's not it at all. It's me seeing me as I really am. Boy, that's discouraging. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and you know, am I willing to die? Go ahead, yeah. Don. And that, you know, in that Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, when he talks about the 12 virgins and talks about that sudden unlooked for calamity, I don't know how many people I ever talked to that are looking for things out there for the sudden unlooked for calamity that brings you face to face with death. And it's not out there, it's in here. That's, that's where right. We're right. Yeah. That's no now Satan. We know that Satan's going to play the game when when the world's falling apart. He's he's he is going to blame this this small group of believers who won't give up their faith in the Word of God and, and the truth of God and, and play the game. The world's going to you know everybody's going to hate you. every every earthly support is going to be removed. So yes, the people society's going to be be. They thinking you're the problem, your friends, your neighbor, your, your, your family members, you know, every earthly support will be removed. This is the story of Job. But the point is, is that that's not what causes the time of trouble for God's people. The time of trouble for God's people is, is when they see themselves and they see themselves as they really are. And that's where the, the real crux of the biscuit is in terms of the Mount of Transfiguration experience. Seeing the glory of God is me seeing myself as I really am. Remember when Daniel beheld in Daniel chapter 10, he sees the revelation of, of, of Christ. 
And then he, he, he falls on his face. He says, my comeliness, my glory, my, my glory was turned to corruption. He sees nothing good in himself. Now, Daniel is one of the three righteous men, one of the three wise men of the Bible. I mean, and here's this guy falling down saying, there's nothing good in me. All I see is filth and corruption. And so, see, see that's why the angel tells him, I've shown you now what, what's going to happen to your people in the last days. Mm. See, that's the crux of the vision right there. That's the issue. That's what God's people are going to see. And in Daniel 12, uh, God tells Daniel, when the power of the holy people has been finally broken, then all these things will come to pass. And it's the same thing that happened to David. I mean, David thought he was okay. And then, then when he became king, um, right? <laughs> That's you know, right. That whole thing was to show him, hey, you're not there yet. You know, all That's those right. things that you thought. Why why was it that he could knock down uh I was listening to I forget who. Why was it that he was able to um kill all the animals, the bears and everything like that? Because it was him and God. That was his strength. But as king, he was looking at himself and all the things that he could have. That's right. And he, came to, he came face to face. That's right. So David was willing to own it. Remember Saul, Saul was not willing to own it. Saul would not let it go. Saul, right. so see there and therein lies the difference, right? So, so guys, this, I'm in Luke a little further down and um, at 51 it says, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered to a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? And that's striking me today, because he's asking, they're asking Jesus, is it your will that we command fire? That's right. That's right. Amazing. And then Jesus tells him, you don't know what kind of spirit you are of. Right. Right. That's right. James says that mercy triumphs over judgment. That's right. Mm -hmm. And see. And, uh, how often when uh, a brother or sister crosses us in the church that we wish we could call fire down on them. See, uh, see this is the, the neat, the part of this so amazing is that when God shows us ourselves, are we saying, God, I want justice? Is that, what you, is that what you want? Is that what you cry out when God shows you your sinful self? Oh, give me justice. Oh, mercy. Justice. <laughs> mercy. No, no, no. no, you cry for mercy. Yeah. Uh, Sue mentioned David, right? So what's the first thing that David mentions in Psalm 51 when God confronts him with himself about being a murderer and, and, and all this stuff that messes in David? What's David pleading for? Is he pleading for justice? No, 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 no. See, see, this, this is what this is important because the social justice movement that's happening in the world is satanic. Yeah. The people running around this planet screaming for justice, they don't even know what they're asking because they're ask, actually asking for their own destruction. Because yeah. what happens in the judgment, and this is so important, God judges me the way I judge others. God yeah. treats me the way I treat others. That's he has to. He has to give me over to the principles by which I choose to function. This is Ezekiel 7. This is in, throughout the scriptures. God judges me the way I judge other people. And so if I'm, if I'm, if I'm seeking God's mercy because I'm seeing myself as I, as I am, then what am I going to be saying? What am I gonna, how am I going to treat other people? It's going to be mercy. I'm going to treat them merciful. And I'm not going to, it doesn't matter how wrong they are. Because I'm, they're they're not any more wrong than me. They need God's mercy the same as I do. And so, God's yeah. mercy is the message. The first angel's message to fear God and give glory to Him. The hour of His judgment has come. Is a message of mercy. It's not a message of justice. We're not seeking justice. Justice. What happened at the cross? Jesus bore my sin in his body on the tree. Jesus died for my sin. I, I, if I accept it, I receive his righteousness. That's Amen. the justice. It's full of, it's more, it's more, justice and mercy have, have come together. 
So again, this, this, this changes the whole tone of the eternal gospel that's proclaimed to the rest of the world. It's not a, uh, it's uh -oh. not an elitist message looking down my nose at other people. Well, I'm sorry, you drink coffee. I'm sorry, you can't get to heaven. What? I'm sorry. When I read, when I read the list of this, of the, of the seven sins that Jesus hates, God hates, coffee isn't there. Eating meat isn't there. No, it's pride <laughs> and selfishness and vanity. You don't know those things that are the poison in our heart. That's what he's trying to cleanse. And the message of mercy that we give to the world, we tell people about a health, health message so that their minds can be clear and they can see and hear and think. But the, they're, they're not saved because they don't because of a health message. Health me right. A health message doesn't save them. Salvation right. comes from God. It's his mercy. And mm -hmm. we want their minds to be clear and their bodies to be cleansed so that they can hear God's voice and think things okay. through and, and choose wisely. But that's not, the, that's not salvation. So, see, this is part of, part of what needs to be made plain because the Elijah messenger is supposed to go before the king to prepare his way. But if we're going before, his, before the king to prepare his way and we're giving a message that's not a message that prepares them to encounter the king, then what are we doing? I, I give all honor and all glory for my wife who showed mercy continuously. And I Amen. thank the Lord for her. Amen. 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 And, and, and please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the things that, we, that we've shared as truth as a church aren't true. That's not what I'm saying. The Sabbath is the Sabbath. The state of debt is true. The health, health message is right. The things that Mrs. White says are true. But, that, but that's not what saves us. No. No, because you can know the Bible, you can know the Bible, you can know the scriptures real well, and you can know all the doctrines, but if you have no relationship with Christ, you're not saved. And that's the same pattern with uh, No, it's, it's very interesting. I'll just share this one thought, and then I'll be quiet. But at the triumphal entry in Matthew 21, um, Mrs. White hones in on something that, that seems like such a little thing, but it's so profound. She hones in on the triumphal entry and she talks about how the people that Jesus healed were the ones, the ones who, who, uh, the, the ones who were lame, they were the ones jumping around with the palm branches and, and the, the different people that he healed and gave, restored gifts, they were the ones using those gifts to glorify God. And then she says, um, so, so in the ancient world, when the kings came in at the triumphal entry, they would have all these slaves and captives they conquered in the army, right? But so mm -hmm. she, then she, she hones in on Lazarus. She says, Lazarus is the one holding the reins of the donkey, mm -hmm. leading him into Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And, and the re why Lazarus? Because Lazarus was died and was resurrected. He becomes a symbol mm -hmm. of those who are going to, to be the positions of responsibility of people in God's kingdom. You have to die and be resurrected to enter the kingdom of God. And so here's Lazarus leading this 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 mm -hmm. foal and Jesus the king is sitting on this foal of a donkey and everybody's throwing the palm branches. Actually it's a feast of tabernacles because they're worshiping the king saying Hosanna Hosanna which means save us please. And here's this guy who died and was dead for 4 days and Jesus resurrected and he's leading the donkey as a as a as a demonstration that any who are willing to die, this king can bring you back to life and restore you to wholeness. See, mm -hmm. that's the gospel of the kingdom. And he's the messenger going before the way to prepare the way for the king. That's, see, that's a picture, a little miniature picture of the kingdom of God right there. That's because, just so beautiful. And because he was rich, he was especially a type of Laodicea, who I think they're rich. But they yeah. can't have the death and resurrection experience. So, so these patterns throughout the scriptures, the patterns are, are teaching us something. And, and of course, we can take this little pattern that I just showed you and, and you can expand it because actually all the gospels have their own chiastic structure. And, you know, you can go, the whole gospel fits into the, a chiastic structure. But um, anyway, God is so good. God Amen. is so good. And what we are, what we are experiencing, what Brother Greg is going through, what I'm going through, what James is going through, what we are going through in our families, what we are going through, and what our world is going to go through, 
everything that that the flesh depends upon is going to fall apart it's going to fail you mm-hmm. you god is going to bring us to the place god is bringing this world to the place where they are going to choose between him or them themselves and their own ideas and before to have a messenger to go and prepare his way which is what he's calling us to do when when he does call us out of the wilderness to go and prepare his way that we need to go with the correct message the invitation of restoration to everyone mm-hmm. it's a message of mercy it doesn't matter what you've been it doesn't matter where you've done it doesn't matter who you are it doesn't matter how wicked bad and nasty you think yourself to be it doesn't matter how dead in sins you are this king can can take that which is dead and give and give life if you will accept him as your lord and your savior you accept his righteousness and confess your sin then he he will heal you he will give you life and Amen. and 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 when this king begins to descend this message is not just going to go with words it's going to go with power with man that's what he's trying to prepare us for And that, that's what, that's, you know, that's what he's put on my heart to share with you tonight. So. Amen. 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 We personally have to experience that power first so that we can be witnesses. That's right. That's right. Manifested but with skin. Yeah. And, and that's what he does when he gives us the strength to overcome those sins that have, that have dominated our lives in the past. So whatever it is, when he gives us the victory over, then we begin to realize, oh, oh, he can, he can fix my equipment. Oh, he can set me free from whatever, whatever addiction or whatever thing I had. And, and if he can do that for me, then he can do that for anyone. And so I, we begin to see the victories in our life where he sets us free. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And that's Amen. exactly what he's trying to do. Amen. And we, and we need to not allow Satan's lies to convince us that this is the way I am and I have to stay this way. That is a lie. And it doesn't matter what it is. And it doesn't matter how long I've been that way either. It's interesting because uh, one of the guys working on my place said to me, do you believe people can change? And I looked at him and I said, Jesus can change anybody. Amen. And he said... He's talking about different things about himself. He wanted change. They, they've come out. The two of them have come out little by little over the six weeks they've been working for me with different stuff. And they want to know if they can be changed. So I told them about my past and who I used to be. And I said, I know God can change anybody because he changed me. And this was what I was. And they just kind of looked at me. But they're... They've got things that they're wrestling with that they're trying to give up. And they, they, they had tried to beat it on their own. And they wanted to know how I beat it. And I said, I didn't. I didn't. I had no power to beat anything. You know, it's Jesus. You know, just point them to Jesus. Amen. 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 Isn't the gospel beautiful? Amen. The gospel is the good news of the king. And if they will accept him as their new king, there's nothing this king can't do in them and for them. Hey, Gene, give them Romans 5.5. 5. Romans 5.5? 5, 5. Yeah. Thank you. God is so good. Amen. So it's kind of funny, you know, I kind of wondered what God was doing, but he knew the needs I had, the things that needed to be done on this place. And he gave me people that would do, could do all of that stuff. Every time I bring up a problem, they go, oh, we we do that too. We do that too. No problem. And then I kept wondering why, how it worked the other way around. And then they start asking me questions. And then I see what my role is because I'm like, Lord, you, you put me here for a reason. You know, there's a reason I'm at this place. You know, what is it? And it turned out it was them. Amen. I, I mean, one of the reasons at any rate, I mean, I don't think that's the whole story, but they're going to be working for me for, you know, right through the fall and probably into the winter. So 
God made sure they had a long-term relationship here. Kind of um, funny how God works. I just think he's so cool. Yes, he is. And when he uses us to help others, then mm -hmm. that, that so much helps us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the time you're being used is the time you don't even realize you're being used. <laughs> and personally, I think it works a lot better that way. Yeah, because if you knew we'd mess, if we knew we'd mess it up. <laughs> That's right. That's so right. I just I I answer their questions. They they did, they did uh they did ask me questions about doctrines because Hank was trying to figure out what kind of animal I was because he'd never heard of anybody that went to church on a Saturday, and he's like, well, why do you go to church on a Saturday? So I explained. And then I turned around and asked him the question and I said, well, why do you go to church on a Sunday? And he said, I don't know. So I explained that too. And then Dominic came walking in and he turned around to Dominic and he said, Dominic, you ever heard of anybody going to church on Saturday? And Dominic lit up like a Christmas tree and he said, yes, my mom. <laughs> wow. So it turned out that his mother, his parents are separated. His father lives up here but his mother's in New York and his mother apparently was either an Adventist or Seventh-day Baptist. So he knows about church on Saturday. And Hank just looked at him like, you've been working with me all these years and you never told me about this, you know? And then Dominic's kind of getting confronted with, well, you know all this stuff, but that's not the way he's living now. So I just kind of walked away and just kind of laughed to myself. And I thought, how cool you are, God, you do all these things. And, you know, I, I used to say to my sponsor, I, you know, I could play along a lot better with God if he could give, would give me the game plan. And she's like, don't <laughs> wait for an email. And um, uh, she's like, no, you wouldn't. You'd say, if you knew the game plan, Gene, you would say, no, I'm taking my Aggies and I'm going home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's my, if my iPad dies here, it's getting low, so. If I vanish, I wasn't raptured. I just, my battery died. So. <laughs> why, don't, why don't we have prayer? And then we, I'm not trying to close discussion, but I just, I know that I'm going to be heading out here in a few minutes. And I just want to end with prayer. Terribly, Father, thank you. Thank you that you're using Gene to reach Dominic and Hank and using Hank and Dominic to reach Gene. And thank you for saving us from ourselves. Thank you for the hell in our lives and the trials that we encounter. Um, because otherwise we'd think we're okay and we trust in ourselves and we would, we would live, be living a lie. Thank you for waking us up out of the, the sleep, uh, the dream, and help us to let go of the things we need to let go of and to grab hold of the things that we need to grab hold of. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear, mm. a mind that thinks and a will that will stand for you. Um, Father, we understand, but we really want to come to stand under so please give us your spirit. Um, give us the strength to die. And then by your grace be resurrected. Uh, that we may bear your glory and your name to a world who doesn't know. Just bless us. Thank you for this, this family, these friends, these fellow believers who are, who are wrestling to know you. And thank you for their encouragement that they are to me. I just bless us as a body and draw us closer together. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.